All right, we are now live for another live reading from my book, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France. And we're reading um, a selection today by Maurice Blondel, one of the uh, four different articles that I, I translated by him that are part of this book. So this, uh, while we're waiting for people to show up and, and get here, I'll tell you a little bit about this. Uh, Maurice Blondel was one of the major players in these debates. He is probably, you know, you could say among the top three, the three most important being Blondel, Etienne Gilson, and uh, Jacques Maritain. Uh, also important are the rationalists, Emile Brehier and um, Leon Braunschweig. And then we have, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other people like Gabriel Marcel, also translated in this book, um, Antonin Sertiange, also translated, and a whole host of, of others who we're going to get to eventually. And one of the reasons why I generated this book in the first place was to restore Blondell's voice to the debates. A lot of Anglophone scholars, that is people in the English-speaking world, really didn't understand the scope of the debates, in part because Gilson and Maritain, two Catholic thinkers who were quite hostile to Blondell for various reasons, managed to um, essentially plant a false understanding of, of the scope of the debates and what the debates were, were centered upon. And uh, this stuff wasn't translated until, you know, 2011 when this, this book came out. So um, Blondell responded both to Gilson in the, the one I read uh, several weeks ago, his article or his, his letter, Does Christian Philosophy Exist as Philosophy? And then he responded to Emile Brehier, who had called him out in his own uh, presentation slash article in the Revue de Metaphysique et de la Morale. So Blondel, you know, shots fired across the bow, um, fired some, some shots himself. And that's what's going on in this piece, Is There a Christian Philosophy? And it's a fairly short piece, um, pages 150 to 157 in this book. So it won't take us the whole hour uh, might even just be half an hour to read this. And then we'll we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion afterwards. Now, this is not a general AMA. This is about the Christian philosophy debates, the thinkers, the topics, and this this book. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll punt on things that are that are not related to that, but I'm happy to answer questions about, about these matters. So let's, let's jump in. Uh, Maurice Blondel, Is There a Christian Philosophy, published in the Revue de Metaphysique et de la Morale uh, in 1931. My dear director, I would not solicit your hospitality if, after the important article Mr. Emile Brehier had published in the June 1931 issue, I had not received multiple letters and identical questions expressing my diverse correspondence, common surprise, unable in my state of health to respond directly to each one and supposing at any rate that among your readers many of the silent ones might themselves wish for some clarification on Brehier's passages that drag me into the fray, I make recourse to your ever-welcoming friendship. I have to thank Mr. Brehier right away for having been willing to call attention to my work. I have always believed that work wanted it and called it a philosophical one, nothing else. He is the one who calls it apologetic and of mere opportunity. This is a dispute that is not just terminological, one that does not concern just my own personal efforts. If it was only that, I would keep silent. A dispute that does not even bear just on the question of Christian philosophy, but that concerns the fundamental attitude and the normative function of pure philosophy. In order to respond to the questions that touch on me personally, it is therefore necessary at the start to distinguish Mr. Brehier's own presuppositions 
his method of discussion, and the character of his solutions. In any case, this will be an occasion to offer him a second and greater thanks for with his so vast erudition, with a quasi megarian rigidity of his theses and antitheses, he forces his readers towards a radical examination. He pulls them out from equivocations, approximations, and oscillations one is often lured into in a subject so complex and so delicate. One, quite rightly, Mr. Brehier sets us on guard against one temptation, to conclude from apparent facts and historical denominations like those of Christian philosophies encountered in different times and in quite heterogeneous doctrines to the real and intrinsically justifiable existence of what are perhaps only verbal conceptions is to be duped by a mirage, to be the victim of an insoluble problem, since the problem then does not even exist. On many points, his detailed critiques inspired by the spirit of intransigent, intransigent scrupulosity usefully bear down on and knock off ruined plaster and jury-rigged concordisms on which it would be ruinous to rely. Still, what seems to be me necessary to maintain, if we want to be historically exact and doctrinally correct, is that our author's multiplied demolitions leave intact the hope in the very outline of the building about which he tells us not only that it was never really built, but that it is impossible to build, even to concede. How the literal correctness of many of his partial allegations does not prevent his global denaturation of the spirit animating fragmentary and imperfect attempts from which Mr. Breyer wants to retain nothing. How much, beyond the notional oppositions and ambiguities, he rightly points out the general interpretation he gives to Augustinianism, to Thomism, or to other philosophical attempts, unduly eliminates what under inadequate vestments gave life to and rendered possible the continuity of an intellectual tradition. How our historians' very dogmatic rationalism uh, becomes irrational and seems to mutilate history just as much as philosophical speculation itself, these are what it would be possible and very instructive to show following this implacable critique's scholarly itinerary point by point. I, I cannot, to my regret, lay it out in detail here, where I should also, on the other hand, have liked to bring up the truth of his just as severe judgments upon Descartes or Malbranche. And before arriving at his case aimed at me, I will confine myself to examining for a moment Mr. Brehier's habitual procedure in this article about, or rather against, Christian philosophy. What is the secret and constant spring of his argumentation? He identifies philosophy with its Hellenic conception, and he identifies this conception with this mass we will soon see gradually defined, with the outcome that anything going beyond or contradicting this rigid, rigorous rationality is pitilessly cast outside of philosophy itself. After that, he's surprised that one could close one's eyes to the evidence of an incurable and absolute incompatibility between the Greek ideal and the Christian contribution an object of scandal for a reason perfectly conscious of itself. It is our turn to be astonished by this dogmatism imposing itself by authority without seeking to justify itself. And what are actually the articles of this credo, or if the word displeases, the assertions of this intrepid rationalism? To affirm that, quote, the goal of Greek philosophy was to investigate the rational, consequently immovable and fixed order that is in things. To attribute to that thought having, quote, discovered the exact and nevariator place that it occupies in the eternal order. To say that the affirmation of the eternity of the world, that of an immovable order, perfectly satisfied the taste for beauty. To bring this notion of the immovable to that of a periodic return, to canonize this pseudo-idea of the world eternal, quote, under the form of an indefinite cycle of series of cycles, under the symbol of the servant, serpent swallowing his tail or the great ear indefinitely bringing back to the same events, to conclude that, quote, all of this forms a whole in a systematic assemblage of well-connected theorems and bearing on realities. That This is the dogma outside of which there is no longer philosophical reason or salvation. 
is this the last word about Hellenism's very history, the perfection of scientific and metaphysical speculation? In return, to envision the idea of a God transcended to the world, to conceive eternity as irreducible to time, to see in time less a physical reality than an aspect of becoming and the condition of growth, to find distinguishing between the indefinite and the infinite to be rational, to recall that from its origin on, philosophy has not been a Sophia, but a quest, a progress, an inventum semper perfectibile, to recall and to develop its explicative and enlivening double function, to enlarge science and the intellect and to make them more flexible to the point of understanding the dignity of singular facts and human persons, to reconcile in thought as they are reconciled in life, the oppositions that abstract understanding believes incompatible, to introduce everywhere a genetic and dynamic point of view that makes the physical and spiritual universe an immense history and a drama, are these then what, under pain of absurdity, would remain excommunicated in the very name of a cult of reason that presents itself alone as the contrary of an apologetics? And if just now we were surprised by what Brahir placed under the name of Hellenism, must we not be surprised again by what he proposes to us so that he can be scandalized by it under the name of Christianity? Quote, this worldless God who throughout an eternity remains inactive and then all of a sudden sets himself to create according to his will, a God who changes nature in order to incarnate himself, who transforms the order he has established, a God who is accessible to pity, in short, a history, a life, a bounty, substituted for a universe of fixed essences, negligible individ individuals, and indefinite recommencements. This is, how can we not employ the word, the caricature that he presents in order to ridicule and abolish forever the very possibility of a Christian thought. Such judgments that one can understand in the works of a Kelsis certainly cannot be attributed to Mr. Brehier, but why suggest them, evoke them, even imply them, effectively make use of them in order to eliminate even the idea of a possible harmony between Christianity's stimulations and the initiatives of philosophical research? After having shown that the Christian contribution was able to contribute to the arrival of a humanism where the problem of universal intelligibility appears compatible and even in solidarity with subjectivity and the progress of the interior life, how does Mr. Brehier not tolerate the idea that such a dialectic of spiritual activity is truly philosophical, that this prog process is perhaps not closed, that Immanentism and atulismo can be only a set of first steps preparing us and raising us to a still more comprehensive conception of the life that is both rational and religious together. Two, after these remarks, one will doubtless be less surprised at the ease with which Mr. Brehier tosses my, my essay, Axion 1893, outside of philosophy, by completely abstracting from the method I made use of, by metamorphizing that book's contents, and by omitting all of my conclusions, reservations, and limits. What is perhaps more difficult to explain is how he finds, without any doubt, his own assertions to be coherent assessments to us seemingly discordant to each other. The problem of action, he says, such as Mr. Blondell raises us, does not have any special relation to Christianity. But then, by discussing this problem that in an aspect, how do you find himself that I, I do, quote, not philosophy, but Christian apologetics? My work, he adds, quote, very closely resembles the problem of serenity and tra the tranquility of the soul, which so occupied ancient thought. But then, would we have to reduce Stoicism, Epicureanism, and other schools to a pure moralism, lacking a universal character, without a physics, or canonic, or theology? And after he's excluded from reason's domain what is involved with the ethical problem itself by casting all of Hellenic philosophy as a strictly objective rationalism, how, how then does he reintegrate within ancient wisdom a preoccupation he had excluded? And since he assimilates my, uh, quote, apologetics to this wisdom of the ancients, he therefore does the same with those of the apologists, but of who and of what? 
Or how does he not see that once again, he fails to recognize the double traditional function, the speculative function and the practical and humanizing function of that philosophy that from Socrates on and even before him aimed at self-possession and at the ideal of the wise man in his connection with the universal order. But if in this point of view, there is already misunderstanding and denaturing of the philosophical plan I pursued, there's even more elimination or reversal of the method to which I constantly and rigorously restricted myself. He gives one to believe, actually, that I secretly start from conclusions previously admitted from an irrational faith that I would be then concerned with introducing, defending, making it be desired. <clears throat> but in accordance with the scientific critical philosophical spirits demand I have from the introduction through the course of the entire work constantly proceeded by an indirect and negative way by examining all of the solutions that were removed only under an imperious's imperious logics and a vital demands double constraint. I had always therefore stood rigidly against the conclusions at which I was constrained to arrive. And these conclusions themselves, what do they consist in? Do they propose a single one of the assertions that compose Christian dogma? Not in the least. I introduce nothing. I enter nowhere into the least content of the Catholic religion. I stop at the threshold, and as a philosopher, I forbid myself finally to pronounce a single little word that I would have to say as a believer. Since one speaks of parti pris, of theses admitted a priori, of irrational apologetics, on whom then does this reproach fall? I have to add as well that what I'm noting is not just my personal view. If in 1893, Paul Jeannette became, as he told me, annoyed with my dissertation, it is not at all because it would have seemed to him to sin against philosophical method and philosophical spirit. Rather, to the contrary, he saw himself forced to recognize, quote, the rationalism of my means, ending up in what he called the irrationalism of my solutions. This is why he did not refuse me my vo his vote, despite it, it costing him seeing a case reopened he had believed and had wanted definitively settled, that of separated and closed philosophy. Gabriel Seal told me that nearly to the end of my work, he'd approved of the truly philosophical development of the discussion without predicting what would come out of it. But this final deception had not rendered it wrong no more than Henri Barillon and Victor Brochat, seeing that Emile Boutreau was right when he, assigned to read the manuscript, had asked permission to print a dissertation that would not have had obtained the favorable unanimity of the judges, even those fundamentally hostile, if they had believed to see there only a disguised apologetics. Louis Liard, at first hesitant, had entrusted me with a chair only after having been convinced of the philosophical character of a research proposing to the audience of all free minds, a problem one can exclude only by mutilating reason itself. And this is what the Revue de Metaphysique and de la Morale recognized in 1894, following the letter that it welcomed in its own supplement to, in which I responded to a first interpretation that some resolute opponents addressed to me, becoming friends at that time. The re-edition of the vocabulaire technique et critique de la philosophie has eliminated the exclusion Frédéric Rao earlier in the discussion of the term action had expressed against a doctrine he did not accept, though he amicably wrote to me he did not fail to recognize its incontestable philosophical character. I will now perhaps surprise my readers by declaring that if I confine myself to saying what Mr. Breyer attributes to me, or even if I had nothing else to propose than what I have published, I would have had to concede to my critic quite more than the preceding argumentation gives one to suppose. In 1896, in a letter published by the Annales de Philosophie Chrétienne, which I would always prefer to have seen entitled Annales Catholique de Philosophie, I had always I had with a youthful, youthful intrepidity that I must ask pardon for now, maintained that in the rigorous sense of its term, Christian philosophy does not exist. I withdraw the too hasty judgment about the object of the present discussion in the Bulletin de Société Française de Philosophie, in which appears my letter written in March 1931 to Mr. Josson in, in, soon to appear, in a soon-to-appear Cahier de la Nouvelle Journée, and particularly in a chapter of the book that I devote to the Esprit Chrétien. Here I can add only one point. Mr. Brahir, 
finds nowhere in history and in his thought a place for Christian philosophy, but that is because he seeks it where it is not, where it cannot be, in a sort of concordism, forcibly equivocal, perilous, even ruinous for philosophy and for religion. Here is a case, still a little illuminated, but one that dominates all the other cases of conflict, confusedly setting at odds the two spiritual powers that seem to oppose each other when it should be a matter of procuring their free and fertile cooperation. One imagines that a philosophy, in order to be Christian, has, to, has need to proceed by coincidences, super impositions, or servitudes. It is exactly the contrary that is true. Far from being impoverished or submitting to an intrusion, philosophical thought has only to carry its examination all the way through to knowledge of its own deficiencies and limits in order to prepare that intellectual disposition with which every sincere mind can be equipped so as to participate in the invisible soul of truth. It is such a disposition of a universal and salutary value rather than a notional concordism whose development as complete as possible we have to secure. And it is on that word of hope and of agreement, I would like to finish these explanations, too long and too short at the same time. So that is Maurice Blondel's short article, um, Is There a Christian Philosophy, published in the Revue de Metaphysique et de la Morale uh, in, in 1931, a response to Emile Brehier's criticism of him, a response to Emile Brehier in general. And that finishes out part one of the, the book, which has to do with the first phase of the Christian philosophy debates. Um, next time, we will start reading from part two, the debates expand 1932 to 1933, with looking at Gabriel Marcel's Regarding the Spirit of Medieval Philosophy by Mr. Etienne Gilson, published in the Nouvelle Revue des Jeunes in 1932. And uh, we, we have a lot more yet to go. <laughs> as, as you can see, looking at the book, uh, the bulk of it is yet to come. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot going on in there. All right, so let's take some, some questions. Um, Lucas says, been watching your Aristotle lectures lately. I'm a Christian. I love that you have all these videos on YouTube to watch and contemplate. Yeah, I, I've been, you know, this is my 10th year, uh, or no, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years. This is my 11th year of being on YouTube, and and I'm going to keep cranking away. I have no intentions of um, stopping anytime soon, probably go for another decade or two, health, you know, uh, uh, remaining good and all that. So, uh, Joseph, how does Blondell's essay on history and dogma fit into his ideas about Christian philosophy? Well, it has to do more with theology, and his his uh, his uh, essay, History and Dogma, also has to do with tradition, and it has implications for um, his views on Christian philosophy, as does, as he mentioned, the letter on apologetics, both of which you find together in the same translation by uh, Drew and Trethowen, right? Those are early works. Um, Oxio 1893, uh, History and Dogma, Letter on Apologetics, The uh, Logic of the Moral Life. Um, all of those are from what we call Blondell's first period, right? And the Christian philosophy debate stuff is really from his, his second period. Uh, he's, he's reconsidering some of the conclusions. As a matter of fact, he mentions a piece that's coming out in the Cahiers de Nouvelle Journée. And um, the, the piece that he's talking about there is actually a book. I've got a copy of which I should have, I should have brought out here to you can take a look at it, um, in which he actually goes through his letter on apologetics and says, I got this part right, I got this part wrong, and then he goes into, into a lot of other stuff. Um, and we're going to talk about the reception of that book later on in, in this piece as well. So, I mean, with Blondell, like with a lot of other systematic thinkers, there's lots of projects going on, but they're all essentially centered by the same overarching goal. And, and Blondell articulated it in this piece. Philosophy should be truly philosophy. Christianity should follow through its, its, its logic to you know, the fullest extent. And the two of them are compatible, but not in a simplistic way, the way that a lot of people oh, you just take some ideas from Christianity and plunk them into philosophy. Blondell says, that's a bad idea. 
you have to have a philosophy that is sophisticatedly and you know sort of honestly developed itself to realize where it has gaps, where it needs something more. And the Christianity can't just be some sort of you know ideology that then gets superimposed on on philosophy. Ricky asks, what is apologetics? So apologetics is a general term for using reason to simply argue a case that you, you're already convinced of. And so, you know, it, we can talk about Christian apologetics. Um, Blondell, you know, turns the thing on to Breyer and says, buddy, you're basically an apologist for uh, Hellenism. That's just as irrational, even if you're pretending to be a philosopher, as Christian apologetics is. And, you know, I, I would actually suggest getting Blondell's letter on apologetics where he says, OK, we could have a good kind of apologetics. All this other stuff that these Christians are doing, this is not actually good apologetics. It, it tends to um, produce conformism rather than an actual, like, you know, real assent to, to things. So, yeah, so good good questions. Any other questions about the, the work or the topics, Blondell, the other thinkers? We're at the nearly the half hour point. Um, this is, this is quite a takedown, you know, of, of Breyer. I mean, Breyer basically doesn't show his face in the debates after Gilson and Blondel, you know, tear him a new one, <laughs> philosophically speaking. Um, and it's, it's thinkers like Blondel and Gilson who are going to go on and make more of an impact than, than Right here. Um, the other main rationalist, Brunschweig, is going to be bringing out some articles. You notice I, I talked about the Revue de Metaphysique et Morale. That was really the flagship um, French journal for philosophy at the time. Um, there were others that were important, but Revue de Metaphysique et Morale was, was kind of like you know the top tier journal. And so a lot of these, these guys publishing in that is, is very significant. I mean, it's, it's significant that Blondell has enough juice to be able to, you know, write to the, um, the director, the, the editor of the review and says, you know, I would not solicit your hospitality if I'd not received multiple letters. I'm going to, you know, uh, make recourse to your ever welcoming friendship and we'll publish this, this, you know, response by me in the journal, so everybody knows what, what my position is. Um, that's, you know, all, a lot of the people involved in these debates were among the, the elite in the philosophical establishment. Um, all right, so Joseph asked, what are the primary differences between Blondell's stages of thought? Um, they're not really differences, it's more a matter of elaboration, you could say. So the early Blondell is already incredibly complex and fertile, you know, and, and you, you want to look at Oxio 1893. If you can read French, um, there's, there's also the Carnet on Team, his, his notebooks from the time when he's working on this stuff. And then, you know, like I mentioned, Letter on Apologetics, History and Dogma, Logic of the Moral Life. Um, we would also probably include a few of the other earlier essays in there. And Blondell has set his main issues that he's, he's interested in, figuring out how to respond to um, the contemporary movements in philosophy, which uh, most Catholic thinkers hadn't done a very good job with. And, you know, a lot of Catholic thought was circling around Thomism at the time, which was um, fairly relatively new, just several generations since, since uh, there was a revival of Thomism. Um, in the late late 19th century, and it became kind of the, the de rigueur kind of thing. Um, Blondell gets accused of modernism. He uses the opportunity to explain, you know, his position in some of his later writings. Then the second phase would would really begin with with that, and it includes his engagements in the Semen social discussions, um, all the way into like the the 20s and early 30s. Um, he has a, a book on mysticism that comes out. He has, uh, you know, this stuff and the um, Problème de la philosophie catholique that comes out. So that's like the middle phase. And then we, the, the last phase, which runs, let's say, arbitrarily from 1930 
43 to his death in 49, he's bringing out the massive metaphysical trilogy um, of uh, uh, La Pensée, uh, L'Action, the new revised L'Action, and Let et les Et, which is actually five volumes, and then some other major works as well, and a lot of occasioned pieces. And he moves away from what he earlier called the method of imminence, which is a, essentially a kind of phenomenology, um, into what he calls the method of implication. Is there vast differences between them? I don't, I don't see vast differences. It's more like you know, a further development of, of his, his thought. And Blondel is, uh, you know, really a major thinker in the um, late 19th century, all the way into the mid 20th century in French thought. He's not very well known over here because he's often um, looked at as a, um, uh, you know, a, what would you call it, a, um, you know, an apologist as, as a religiously committed thinker. And, and I think the English speaking world was kind of allergic to that. Um, but he had massive influence uh, across the, 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 the French uh, thought. Um, it's interesting too, because when we see like people remarking about the French turn to, you know, back to religion and phenomenology in the nineties, um, if you know anything about French thought, you're like, there wasn't any, turn people have been doing this the entire time it didn't get reinvented with jean-luc mario and michelle henry you know uh, what about paul ricoeur what about maurice blondel what about uh, uh gabriel marcel what about all these other other people Etienne born you know um so th there's there's a lot of here's here's where I'll, I'll wrap this up there's a vast difference between continental philosophy and then actual european philosophy what we call continental philosophy here is like a narrow little window into the vastness of what is actually happening in Europe. And uh, oftentimes we have to turn to, to other perspectives to understand what's, what's really happening over there and not, not you know, go after what's trendy and, and what's getting translated into to English. And again, I, I translated the stuff that's in here in part because it needed to be translated, you know. All right. Any other any other questions? <clears throat> people want me to tackle. I had to drink some water. I've been talking since uh, the early morning. Ricky, does Blondell mention any of the early Christian philosophers? Uh, yeah, um, not in not in this letter, um, but in in plenty of other places. Yeah. And when we talk about the early Christian philosophers, a lot of people, you know, they immediately go back to Augustine. But Augustine is actually, you know, a latecomer patristically, right? We have Justin Martyr and Tatian and Lactantius and uh, Clement of Alexandria and all these other, you know, great thinkers who are explicitly philosophers and working in a philosophical thing. And then we have other people who, you know, in, in the, the early Middle Ages were, were called philosophers like John Cassian, even though he's a monastic figure, um, monasticism was called the Christian philosophy. So yeah, Blondell talks about these people, but he's, he's very concerned that we don't just like say, oh, well, Christian philosophy is exactly what these people back in, you know, 200 AD or 1200 AD said it was because we live in a, a modern culture. So it's not that we throw them away, but we can't just um, simply follow them out um, and, and reimpose them. This was particularly a problem with Thomism at the time that, that Blondell was writing. There was something that you could almost call like a fundamentalism of the Summa, you know, the idea that Thomas has all the answers. We just got to find the right spot in the Summa where he talks about it. And um, yeah, there's still a good bit of that going on today as well. Um, all right, any other questions, comments? Clarifications. All right. Well, I think I will wrap this up at this point and go get myself some some lunch. Um, I've been 
on with one thing or another with classes, clients, or events since uh, the morning. And I'm going to take a little break, have some lunch, and then get ready for the rest of my day. Thanks for all the questions and comments, and I uh, hope all of you enjoy it. We'll be picking up with this again, uh, moving into the next part um, in, in our next session. And we're making some good progress. Uh, it's taken a while, but uh, yeah. All right, I'll see all of you somewhere in the ether.